Chapter 26 The Cave Harry could smell salt and hear rushing waves. A light, chilly breeze ruffled his hair as he looked out at moonlit sea and star stream sky. He was standing upon a high old crab of dark rock, water forming and churning below him. He glanced over his shoulder. A towering cliff stood behind them, a sheer drop, black and faceless. A few large chunks of rock, such as the one upon which Harry and Dumbledore were standing, looked as though they had broken away from the cliff face at some point in the past. It was a bleak, harsh view, the sea and the rock unrelieved by any tree or sweep of grass or sand. The sea and the rock unrelieved by any tree or sweep of grass or sand. Devam. Çok anlamadım ama önemi yok yani. What do you think? Asked Dumbledore. He might have been asking Harry's opinion on whether it was a good site for a picnic. They brought the kids from orphanage here as Terry who could not imagine a less cozy spot for a day trip. Not here, precisely, said Dumbledore. There is a village of sorts about halfway along the cliffs behind us. I believe the orphans were taken there for a little sea air and a view of the waves. No, I think it was only ever Tom Middle and his youthful victims who visited this spot. No muggle could reach this rug unless they were uncommonly good mountaineers, and boats cannot approach the cliffs. The waters around them are too dangerous. I imagine that Riddle climbed down. Magic would have served better than ropes, and he brought two small children with him. I imagine that Riddle climbed down. Magic would have served better than ropes, and he brought two small children with him. Büyüyle resmen büyük kullanıp iki uşağı da indirmiş falan. Probably for the pleasure of terrorizing them. I think the journey along would have done it, don't you? Terry looked up at the cliff again and felt close bounds. Gürültüleri diken diken olmuş. But his final destination and ours lies a little farther on. Come. Dumbledore beckoned, beckoned Harry to the very edge of the rock where a series of jagged niches, niches made footholds leading leading down to boulders that lay half submerged in water and closer to the cliff. It was a treacherous descent and Dumbledore, hampered slightly by his withered hand, moved slowly. The lower rocks were slippery with weather, sea water, Harry could feel flecks of cold salt spray hitting his face. Lumos, al Samalim. Lumos said Dumbledore as he reached the boulder closest to the cliff face. A thousand flecks of golden light sparkled upon the dark surface of the water a few feet below where he crouched. The black wall of rock beside him was illuminated too. You see, said Dumbledore quietly, holding his wand a little higher. Harry saw a fissure in the cliff into which dark water was swirling. You will not object to getting a little wet, no, said Harry. Then take off your invisibility clock. There is no need for it now, and let us take the plunge. And with the sudden agility of a much younger man, Dumbledore slid from the boulder, landed in the sea, and began to swim with a perfect breeze stroke. Shoyle, breeze stroke. Göğüs at, buna kulaç, kulaç herhalde, kulaç atıyor. Tower the dark slid in the rock face, his little wand held in his teeth. He pulled off his claw, started into his pocket and followed. The water was icy, his waterlogged claws belowed around him and weighted him down. Taking deep breaths that filled his nostrils with the tank of salt and seaweed, he struck out for the shimmering, shrinking light now moving deeper into the cliff. The fissure soon opened into a dark tunnel that Harry could tell would be filled with water at high tide. High tide bunda şeydi. Ben bir belgesel izledim orada da gördük ama derste de işlediydik şey. Fizik 226 gel git. Aynen. Suyular yükseliyor, alçalıyor falan ya. Onu diyor. Yani burası dolar diyor. Harry could tell would be the fissure soon opened into a dark tunnel. Dark tunnel'ın kendisi dead. Kendisi, Harry could tell, will be filled with water at high tide. 
the slimy walls were barely three feet apart and glimmered like wet tar in the passing light of Dumbledore's wand. A little way in, the passageway curved to the left, and he saw that it extended far into the cliff. He continued to swim in Dumbledore's way, the tips of his benumbed fingers brushing the rough, wet rock. Then he saw Dumbledore rising out of the water ahead, his silver hair and dark robes gleaming. When he reached the spot, he found steps that led into a large cave. He clambered up them, water streaming from his soaking clothes, and emerged, shivering uncontrollably into the still and freezing air. Dumbledore was standing in the middle of the cave, his wand held high as he turned slowly on the spot, examining the walls and ceiling. Yes, this is the place, said Dumbledore. How can you tell it is spoken a wish, but it has no magic, said Dumbledore, simply. Harry could not tell whether the shivers he was experiencing were due to his spine-deep coldness or to the same awareness of enchantments. He watched as Dumbledore continued to revolve on the spot, evidently concentrating on things he could not see. This is merely the antechamber, the entrance hall, said Dumbledore after a moment or two. We need to penetrate the inner place. Now it is Lord Voldemort's obstacles that stands in our way, rather than those nature made. Dumbledore approached the wall of the cave and caressed it with his blackened fingertips, murmuring words in a strange tongue that he did not understand. Twice Dumbledore walked right around the cave, touching as much of the rough rock as he could, occasionally pausing, turning his fingers backward and forward over a particular spot, until finally he stopped, his hand pressed flat against the wall. Here, he said, we go on through here, the entrance is concealed. He did not ask how Dumbledore knew. He had never seen a wizard work things out like this, simply by looking and touching. But he had long since learned that bangs and smoke were more often the marks of ineptitude than expertise. But Harry had long since learned that bangs and smoke were more often the marks of ineptitude than inexpertise. Ha. Böyle çok şatafatlı bir şeyler oluyorsa genelde expertise değil, acemili işaret ediyor. Uzmanlık olduğu yerde büyü çok da görünmüyor. Büyü çok da şaşalı olmuyor falan gibi bir şey güzel bir bence. Dumbledore stepped back from the cave wall and pointed his wand at the rock. For a moment, as an arced outline appeared, there, blazing white as though there was a powerful light behind the crack. You've done it, said Eddie through chattering teeth, but before the words had left his lips, the outline had gone, leaving the rock as bare and solid as ever. Dumbledore looked around. Hiri, I am so sorry I forgot, he said. He now pointed his wand at Hiri and at once, his clothes were as warm and dry as if they had been hanging in front of a blazing fire. Thank you, said Eddie gratefully, but Dumbledore had already turned his attention back to the solid cave wall. He did not try any more magic, but simply stood there, staring at it intently, as though something extremely interesting was written on it. It stayed quite still. He did not want to break Dumbledore's concentration. Then, after two solid minutes, Dumbledore said quietly, Oh, surely not. So crude. What is it, Professor? I rather think, said Dumbledore, putting his uninjured hand inside his robes and drawing out a short silver knife of the kind he used to chop portion ingredients that we are required to make payment to pass. Payment, said Eddie. You got to give the door something. Yes, said Dumbledore, blood, if I am not much mistaken. Blood? I said it was crude, said Dumbledore, who sounded disdainful, even disappointed, as though Voldemort had fallen short of the standards Dumbledore expected. The idea, as I am sure you will have gathered, is that your enemy must weaken him or herself to enter. Once again, Lord Voldemort, fails to grasp that there are much more terrible things than physical injury. Yeah, but still, if you can avoid it, said Harry, 
who had experienced enough pain not to be keen for more. <laughs> Sometimes, however, it is unavoidable that Dumbledore shaking back the sleeve of his robes and exposing the forearm of his injured hand. Professor protested Hedy, hurrying forward as Dumbledore raised his knife. I'll do it, I am. He did not know what he was going to say. Younger, fitter. But Dumbledore merely smiled. There was a flash of silver and a spirit of scarlet and in spirit of scarlet, the dark face was peppered with dark, glistening drops. You are very kind, he said Dumbledore, now passing the tip of his wand over the deep cut he had made in his own arm, so that it healed instantly, just as Snape had healed now for his wounds. But your blood is worth more than mine. Ah, that seems to have done the trick, doesn't it? The blazing silver outline of an arch Arc had appeared in the wall once more, and this time it did not fade away. The blood spattered rock within it simply vanished, leaving an opening into what seemed total darkness. After me, I think, said Dumbledore, and he walked through the archway with Harry on his heels, lighting his own wand hastily as he went. A near eye sight met, met their eyes. They were standing on the edge of a great black lake. So was that Harry could not make out the distant banks in a cavern so high that the ceiling too was out of sight. A misty greenish light shone far away in what looked like the middle of the lake. It was reflected in the completely still water below. The greenish glow and the light from the two wands were the only things that broke the otherwise velvety blackness. Though their rays did not penetrated as far as Harry would have expected. The darkness was somehow denser than normal darkness from the beautiful and dangerous. Let us walk, said Dumbledore quietly. Be very careful not to step into the water. Stay close to me. He set off around the edge of the lake, and Harry followed close behind him. Their footsteps made a coin, slapping sounds on the narrow rim of rock that surrounded the water. On and on they walked. But the view did not vary. On one side of them, the rough cavern wall, on the other, the boundless expanse of smooth, glassy blackness, in the very middle of which was that mysterious greenish blow. Here you found the place and the silence oppressive, unnerving. Professor said, finally, do you think the Horcrux is here? Oh, yes, said Dumbledore. Yes, I am sure it is. The question is, how do we get to it? We couldn't, we couldn't just try, we couldn't, we couldn't just try a morning charm, he said. Sure that it was a stupid suggestion, but he was much keener than he was prepared to admit on getting out of this place as soon as possible. Certainly we could, said Dumbledore, stopping so suddenly that he almost walked into him. Why don't you do it? Me? Oh, okay. Harry had not expected this, but cleared his throat and said loudly, Wong aloft, Akio Horcrux. With a noise like an explosion, something very large and pale erupted out of the dark water some 20 feet away. Before Harry could see what it was, it had vanished again with a crashing splash that made great, deep ripples on the mirrored surface. Hiri left backward in shock and he and hit the wall. His heart was still thundering as he turned to Dumbledore. What was that? Something, I think, that is ready to respond should we attempt to seize the Horcrux. He looked back at the water. The surface of the lake was once more shining black glass. The ripples had vanished unnaturally fast. Hiri's heart, however, was still pounding. Did you think that would happen, sir? I thought something would happen if we made an obvious attempt to get our hands on the Horcrux. That was a very good idea, Harry. Much the simplest way of finding out what we are facing. But we don't know what the thing was, said Harry, looking at the sinisterly smooth water. What the things are, you mean? said Dumbledore. I doubt very much that there is only one of them. 
Shall we welcome Professor? Yes, Eddie. Do you think we're going to have to go into the lake, into it, only if we are very unfortunate? You don't think the Horcrux is at the bottom? Oh no, I think the Horcrux is in the middle. And Dumbledore pointed toward the Mr. Green light in the center of the lake. So we're going to have to cross the lake to get to it? Yes, I think so. He did not say anything. His toes were all of water monsters, of giant serpents, of demons, kelpies, and sprites. Uh -huh. Hannah said Dumbledore and he stopped again. This time, it really did walk into him. For a moment, he toppled on the edge of the dark water, and Dumbledore's uninjured hand closed tightly around his upper arm, pulling him back. So sorry, Harry, I should have given warning. Stand back against the wall, please. I think I have found a place. He had no idea what Dumbledore meant. This patch of dark bank was exactly like every other bit as far as he could tell, but Dumbledore seemed to have detected something special about it. This time, he was running his hand, not over the rocky wall, but through the thin ear. As though expecting to find and grip something invisible. Well said Dumbledore happily. Oh, Father Nerelle. Seconds later, his hand had closed in midair upon something he could not see. Dumbledore moved closer to the water. He watched nervously as the tips of Dumbledore's buckled shoes found the utmost edge of the rock rim. Keeping his hand clenched in midair, Dumbledore raised his wand with the other and tapped his first, tapped his face with the point. Immediately, a thick coppery green chain appeared out of thin air, extending from the depths of the water into Dumbledore's clenched hand. Dumbledore tapped the chain, which began to slide through his fist like a snake. Should I sorry, Elder? Coiling itself on the ground with a clinking sound that he caught noisily off the rocky he was. Yoksa kollarına mı düşmeye başlıyor? Not sure. Pulling something from the depths of the black water. He gasped as the ghostly probe of the tiny boat broke the surface, glowing as green as the chain, and floated with barely a ripple covered the place on the bank where Harry and Dumbledore stood. How did you know that was there? Harry asked in astonishment. Magic always leaves traces, said Dumbledore. As the both hit the bank with a gentle bump, sometimes very distinctive tra traces. I told Tom Riddle, I know his style. I name breathed out of region. Magic always leaves traces, said Dumbledore as the boat hit the bank with a gentle bump, sometimes very distinctive traces. I told Tom Riddle, I know his style. Is, is this boat safe? Oh yes, I think so. Voldemort needed to create a means to cross the lake without attracting the breath of those creatures, creatures he had placed within it in case he ever wanted to visit or remove his Horcrux. So the things in the water won't do anything to us if we cross in Voldemort's boat. I think we must resign ourselves to the fact that they will at some point realize we are not Lord Voldemort. Thus far, however, we have done well. They have allowed us to raise the boat. But why have they let us, as Harry, who could not shake off the vision of tentacles rising out of the dark water the moment they were out of sight of the bank? Voldemort would have been reasonably confident that none but a very great wizard would have been able to find the boat, said Dumbledore. I think he would have been prepared to risk what was, to his mind, the most unlikely possibility that somebody else would find it, knowing that he had set other obstacles ahead that only he would be able to penetrate. We shall see whether he is right. Diyor ki Voldemort büyük ihtimal hiç kimsenin o şeyi kayı bulabileceğini düşünmedi diyor. Ama bulurlarsa bile diye düşündü diyor Dumbledore. 
ilerideki engelleri kesinlikle kimse aşamayacak benden başka diyor. İlerideki engelleri kimse aşamayacağı düşüncesi Voldemort'u rahatlattığı için kayıya başka bir binerse bile o yaratıkların o kişiye saldırmasına şey etmedi. Hani bu kayı bulmak o kadar zor ki çünkü falan şey etmiyor. Ne etmiyor? Hiçbir şey etmemiş. O kayı bulan birisi yoluna devam ediyor. Hani özellikle ona şey etmiş çünkü o kayı zaten kimse bulamayacağını düşünmüş. Hani diyelim o normal derecede bir ihtimal oldu ve birisi bulabildi falan. Şu an Dumbledore'un olduğu gibi. Sorun yok diyor. İlerideki engelleri zaten aşamayacaklar falan diye düşünüyor Voldemort. Sorun etmiyor yani. O çok düşük ihtimal gerçekleşirse bile sorun olmaz diyor. Yine benim için diyor. Dumbledore bunu anlatıyor. Voldemort böyle düşünüyor diyor. Devam der. It looked down into the boat. It really was very small. It doesn't look like it was built for two people. Will it hold both of us? Will we be too heavy together? Dumbledore chuckled. Voldemort will not have cared about the way, but about the amount of magical power that crossed his leg. I rather think an enchantment will have been placed upon this boat so that only one wizard at a time will be able to sail in it. I rather think an enchantment will have been placed upon this boat so that only one wizard at a time will be able to sail in it. But then, I do not think you will count, Hedy. They are underage and unqualified. Voldemort will never have expected a 16-year-old to reach this place. I think it unlikely that your powers will register compared to mine. These words did nothing to raise Harry's morale. Perhaps Dumbledore knew it, for he added, Voldemort's mistake, Harry, Voldemort's mistake. Age is foolish and forgetful when it underestimates you. Now, you first, you first this time, and be careful not to touch the water. Dumbledore stood aside and Harry climbed carefully into the boat. Dumbledore stepped in too, coiling the chain onto the floor. They were crammed in together. Harry could not comfortably sit, but crushed, his knees jutting over the edge of the boat, which began to move at once. There was no sound other than the silken rustle of the boat's croak leaving the water. It moved without their help, as though an invisible rope was pulling it onward toward the light in the center. Soon they could no longer see the walls of the cavern. They might have been at sea, except that there were no waves. Harry looked down and saw the reflected gold of his wand light sparkling and glittering on the black water as they passed. The boat was carving deep ripples upon the glassy surface, grooves in the dark mirror. And then Harry saw it, marble white, floating inches below the surface. Professor, he said, and his startled voice, he called loudly over the silent water. Harry, I think I saw a hand in the water, a human hand. Yes, I am sure you did, said Dumbledore calmly. Harry stared down into the water, looking for the vanished hand, and a sick feeling rose in his throat. So that thing that jumped out of the water, but Harry had his answer before Dumbledore could reply. The one light had slid over a fresh patch of water and showed them this time a dead man lying face up, inches beneath the surface. His open eyes misted as though with cobwebs, his hair and his robes swirling around him like smoke. There are bodies in here, said Harry. And his voice sounded much higher than usual and more and most unlike his own. Yes, said Dumbledore placidly, but we do not need to worry about them at the moment. At the moment, he repeated, tearing his gaze from the water to look at Dumbledore. Not while they are merely drifting peacefully below us, said Dumbledore in espri yapıyor. Voldemort'un cave'inde espri yapıyor, Dumbledore böyle bir insan. There is nothing to be feared from a body, Harry, any more than there is anything to be feared from the darkness. 
Lord Voldemort, who of course secretly fears both disagrees. But once again, he reveals his own lack of wisdom. It is the unknown we fear when we look upon death and darkness, nothing more. Ay ne, bu laf güzelmiş, burada bir duralım. Diyecek bir şey vardır belki. Devam. Harry said nothing. He did not want to argue, but he found the idea that there were bodies floating around them and beneath them horrible and what was more, he did not believe that they were not dangerous. But one of them jumped, he said, trying to make his voice as level and calm as Dumbledore's. When I tried to summon the Horcrux, a body leapt out of the lake. Yes, said Dumbledore, I am sure that once we take the Horcrux, we shall find them less peaceable. However, like many creatures that dwell in cold and darkness, they fear light and warmth which we shall therefore call to our aid should Danny arise. Fire, Harry Dumbledore added with a smile in response to Harry's bewildered expression. Oh, right, said he. Quickly, he turned his head to look at the greenish glow towered which the boat was still inexorably sailing. He could not pretend now that he was not scared. The great black lake teeming with the dead. It seemed hours and hours ago that he had met Professor Trelawney, that he had given Ron Harmony Felix Felicis. He suddenly wished he had said a better goodbye to them, and he hadn't seen Ginny at all. Nearly there, said Dumbledore cheerfully. Sure enough, the greenish light seemed to be growing larger at last, and within minutes, the boat had come to a halt, bumping gently into something that he could not see at first. But when he raised his illuminated wand, he saw that they had reached a small island of smooth rock in the center of the lake. Careful not to touch the water, said Dumbledore again, as he climbed out of the boat. The island was no larger than Dumbledore's office, an expanse of flat dark stone on which stood nothing but the source of that greenish light, which looked much brighter when Weaved close to. He squinted at it. At first, he thought it was a lamp of some kind, but then he saw that the light was coming from a stone basin, rather like the pine seed, which was set on top of a pedestal. pedestal. Dumbledore approached the basin and Harry followed. Side by side, they looked down into it. The basin was full of an metal liquid emitting the Phosphorescent glow. What is it? asked Harry quietly. I am not sure, said Dumbledore. Something more worrisome than blood and bodies, however. Dumbledore pushed back the sleeve of his robe over his blackened hand and stretched out the tips of his burned fingers toward the surface of the potion. Sir, no, don't touch. I cannot touch, said Dumbledore, smiling faintly. See, I cannot approach any nearer than this. You try. Stating, he put his hand into the basin and attempted to touch the potion. He made an invisible barrier that prevented him coming within an inch of it. Within an inch of it. No matter how hard he pushed, his fingers encountered nothing but what seemed to be solid and inflexible air. Out of the way, please, he said Dumbledore. He raised his wand and made complicated movements over the surface of the potion, murmuring soundlessly. Nothing happened, except perhaps that the potion glowed a little brighter. He remained silent while Dumbledore worked, but after a while Dumbledore withdrew his wand, and he felt it was safe to talk again. You think the Horcrux is in there, sir? Oh yes, Dumbledore peered more closely into the basin. Harry saw his face reflected upside down in the smooth surface of the green potion. But how to reach it? This, this potion cannot be penetrated by hand, vanished, parted, scooped up, or siphoned away, nor can it be transfigured, charmed, or otherwise made to change its nature. Almost absent-mindedly, Dumbledore raised his wand again 
twirled it once in mid-air and then caught the crystal goblet that he had conjured out of nowhere. I can only conclude that this potion is supposed to be drunk. What said he? No. Yes, I think so. Only by drinking it can I empty the basin and see what lies in its depths. But what if what if it kills you? Oh, I thought that it would work like that's a dumb do easily. Lord Voldemort would not want to kill the person who reached this island. He couldn't believe it. Was this more of Dumbledore's insane determination to see good in everyone? Sir, said Hiri, trying to keep his voice reasonable. Sir, this is Voldemort we are talking about, Olamnij. I'm sorry, Hiri, I should have said he would not want to immediately kill the person who reached this island, Dumbledore corrected himself. He would want to keep them alive long enough to find out how they managed to penetrate so far through his defenses and, most importantly of all, why they were so intent upon emptying the basin. Do not forget that Lord Voldemort believes that he alone knows about his horcruxes. Do not forget that Lord Voldemort believes that he alone knows about his horcruxes. Yani bir şekilde bunu dediğimi hatırlıyorum önceden. Dumbledore böyle ne zaman Voldemort hakkında konuşursa bir de böyle hani Voldemort's imagination falan dediği yerlerde beynimizin içinde bir yerler gülümsüyor falan dediğim hani hatırlarsınız. Şey fark ettim yine böyle şey falan diyor. Yani. He will want to keep them alive long enough to find out how they managed to penetrate so far through his defenses and most importantly of all why they were so intent upon emptying the basin falan. Tam olarak böyle Voldemort'un ne yapacağının doğru da olduğunu bildiğimiz bir şekilde tahminlerde bulunuyor yani. Hani bu aralarda işte Voldemort hakkında doğru tahminler yaptığını gördüğümüz için Dumbledore'un biz böyle kafamızın içinde bir yerlerde Voldemort'un hödük suratı oluşuyor böyle. Dumbledore ne derse böyle o hödük suratın hepsine Dumbledore söyledi her şeyin o hödük surata yakıştığını görüyoruz gibi bir şey oluyor kafamızın içinde yani. Böyle şey düşündüm. Filmdeki Voldemort'u oraya koydum falan. Böyle filmdeki Voldemort'un suratı kafamın içinde böyle yeri geldi, şaşırdı, yeri geldi. Öyle hiç de öyle değil falan yaptı. Böyle aslında öyle falan şey oldu. Hani filmdeki Voldemort'un suratını kafamın içinde bu Dumbledore'un hakkında esprili vari bir şekilde konuştuğu Voldemort'un suratı olarak düşündüğüm zaman yine kafamın içinde bir şeyler gülümsemeye devam ediyor. Sonuç olarak ne diyorsun Abdullah? Yani şunu diyorum. Filmdeki Voldemort iyi diyorum. Evet. Gayet böyle kitaptaki Voldemort'un hödüklüğünü falan karşılayabilecek şeyi var böyle. Harika ya var ya. Filmdeki Voldemort bayağı iyi yani aslında. Tamam kırmızı gözlü değil. Tamam hani böyle aşırı derecede yılana benziyor falan da değil belki. Kitaptaki Voldemort gibi değil belki. Ama mentalite aynı. Ve o mentaliteyi iyi yansıtıyor yani. Evet. Devam. He made to speak again, but this time Dumbledore raised his hand for silence, frowning slightly at the emerald liquid, evidently thinking hard. Undoubtedly, he said finally, this portion must act in a way that will prevent me taking the Horcrux. It might paralyze me, cause me to forget what I, what I am here for. Create so much pain. I am distracted or render me incapable in some other way. This being the case, Hedy, it will be your job to make sure I keep drinking, even if you have to tip the potion into my protesting mouth. You understand? Their eyes met over the basin, each pale face lit with that strange green light. Hedy did not speak. Was this why he had been invited along? so that he could force feed Dumbledore a potion that might cause him an endurable pain. You remember, said Dumbledore, the condition on which I brought you with me? He hesitated, looking into the blue eyes that had turned green in the reflected light of the basin. But what if you swore, did you not, to follow any command I gave you? Yes, but I warned you, did I not, that there might be danger? Yes, said Hedy, but... Well, then, said Dumbledore, shaking back his sleeves once more and raising the empty goblet, 
you have my orders. Why can't I drink the poison? Instead, asked Ellie desperately. Because I am much older, much cleverer, and much less valuable, said Dumbledore. Once and for all, Ellie, do I have your word that you will do all in your power to make me keep drinking? Couldn't do I have it, but your word, Ellie. I write, but before Ellie could make any further protest, Dumbledore lowered the crystal goblet into the potion. For a split second, he hoped that he would not be able to touch the potion with the goblet. But the crystal sank into the surface as nothing else had. When the glass was full to the brim, Dumbledore lifted it to his mouth. Your good health, Hedy, as he drained the goblet. He watched, terrified, his hands gripping the rim of the basin so hard that his fingertips were numb. Professor, he said anxiously as Dumbledore lowered the empty glass. How do you feel? Dumbledore shook his head, his eyes closed. He wondered whether he was in pain. Dumbledore plunged the glass blindly back into the basin, refilled it, and drank once more. In silence, Dumbledore drank three goblets full of the potion. Then, halfway through the fourth goblet, he staggered and fell forward against the basin. His eyes were still closed, his breathing heavy. Professor Dumbledore said, hitting his voice strained, can you hear me? Dumbledore did not answer. His face was twitching as though he was deeply asleep, but dreaming a horrible dream. His grip on the goblet was slackening. The potion was about to spill from it. He reached forward and grasped the crystal cup, holding it steady. Professor, can you hear me? He repeated loudly his voice echoing around the cavern. Dumbledore panted and then spoke in a voice he did not recognize, for he had never heard Dumbledore frightened like this. I don't want, don't make me. He stared into the whitened face he knew so well, and the crooked nose and half moon spectacles, I did not know what to do. Don't like, want to stop, Mount Dumbledore. You, you can't stop, Professor said Hiri. You got to keep drinking, remember? You told me you had to keep drinking here. Hating himself, repulsed by what he was doing, he forced the goblet back toward Dumbledore's mouth and tipped it so that Dumbledore drank the remainder of the potion inside. No, he groaned. He did lower the goblet back into the basin and refilled it for him. I don't want to. I don't want to. Let me go. It's all right, Professor, said Hedy. He said, shaking, it's all right, I'm here. Make it stop, make it stop, Mount Dumbledore. Yes, yes, this will make it stop, light, Hedy. He tapped the contents of the goblet into Dumbledore's open mouth. Dumbledore screamed. The noise he called all around the vast chamber, across the dead black water. No, no, no, no, I can't, I can't, don't make me, I don't want to. It's all right, Professor, it's all right, said Harry loudly, his hands shaking so badly he could hardly scoop up the sixth goblet full of potion. The basin was now half empty. Nothing's happening to you. You're safe. It isn't real. I swear it isn't real. Take this now. Take this. And obediently, Dumbledore drank, as though it was an antidote Harry offered him. But upon draining the goblet, he sank to his knees, shaking uncontrollably. It's all my fault. All my fault, he sobbed. Please make it stop. I know I did wrong. Oh, please make it stop. And I'll never, never again. And it, but yeah, it's a job, of course. Bir yanlış okumuşum. Bir kere daha okuyacağım onun için. It's all my fault. All my fault, he sobbed. Please make it stop. I know I did wrong, but oh, please make it stop and I'll never, never again. This will make it stop, Professor Eddie said, his voice cracking as he tipped the seventh glass of potion into Dumbledore's mouth. Dumbledore began to cover as the invisible torturer surrounded him. His flailing hand almost knocked the refilled goblet from Eddie's trembling hands as he moaned. Don't hurt them. 
Don't hurt them, please. Please, it's my fault. Hurt me instead. Ne bildiğimiz tek şey açıklama şey işte. Grindelwald'un çatlayıp şey etmesi. Aberford'la savaşmaya başlaması. Aberford'a zarar vermesi falan. Aberford'un şeyin. Grindelwald'un Aberford'a zarar vermeye kalkışması gibi bir şey. Dumbledore'un Grindelwald'un gerçek tarafını gördükten sonra işte Grindelwald'la dövüşmeye başlamaları falan. Bu esnada ve kendi kız kardeşinin arada kaynaması hani. Don't hurt them, don't hurt them, please, please. It's my fault, hurt me instead falan. Bu herhalde sonrasında sahip olduğu bir düşünce. Bir şekilde Aberforth için de çok korktu. Yani ona bir şey olmadıysa bile kız kardeşine oldu ama. Kız kardeş için de çok korktu falan. Öyle. Dumbledore'un temelinde yatan şey bu yani. Ne derler? Olay bu. Dumbledore'un etrafında yuvarlaklar çizdiği sayesinde tam anlamıyla kendini gerçekleştirmediği bu yani. Yani kendi gerçekleştirmeyince gerçekleştirmedi deyince aslında olmuyor. Tam bu doğru gerçekleştirmediyse kimse gerçekleştirmedi zaten falan oluyoruz. Hani Phoenix, Jetshirt olayları tam durum ve Phoenix'e sahip olması onlar direkt zaten kendi gerçekleştirdi elementleri eyvallah. Ama şu olay hani herkesin zayıf yönü Jetshirt var şu seride. Da- Voldemort ölülerden korkuyor. Snape ölü bir kadına aşık falan. Dumbledore da kendi kız kardeşinin hayatının sonlanmasının kendi yüzünden olduğunu düşündüğü için hayatı boyunca hep kendini cezalandırma, suçlan, suçlama, cetçürt kafasında falan bir insan. Dumbledore'un da şey var yani, bir olayı var. Hani herini yok. Yok, aynı. Diyecek bir şey yok gibi sanki. Devam ediyor. Here. Drink this, drink this, you'll be all right, said Harry desperately. And once again, Dumbledore obeyed him, opening his mouth, even as he kept his eyes tight shut and shook from head to foot. And now he fell forward, screaming again, hammering his fist to the palm of the ground, while Harry filled the next goblet. Please, please, please, no, not that, not that, I'll do anything. Just drink, professor, just drink. Dumbledore drank like a child dying of thirst. But when he had finished, he yelled again as though his insides were on fire. No more, please, no more. He scooped up a tenth goblet full of potion and felt the crystal scrape the bottom of the basin. You're nearly there, professor. Drink this, drink it. He supported Dumbledore's shoulders and again, Dumbledore drained the glass. Then he was on his feet once more, refilling the goblet as Dumbledore began to scream in more anguish than ever. I want to die. I want to die. Make it stop. Make it stop. I want to die. I want to die in the barrio. Çok şiddetli. Drink this, professor. Drink this. Dumbledore drank. And no sooner had he finished, then he yelled, Kill me! This, this one will get steady. Just drink this, it'll be over, all over. Dumbledore gulped at the goblet, drained every last drop, and then, with a great rattling gasp, rolled over onto his face. No, shooted Harry, who had stood to refill the goblet again, instead he dropped the cup into the basin flung himself down beside Dumbledore and heaved him over onto his back. Dumbledore's glasses were askew, his mouth again, his eyes closed. No, said Harry, shaking Dumbledore. No, you're not there. You said it wasn't poison. Wake up, wake up. Generated cried his wand pointing at Dumbledore's chest. There was a flash of red light, but nothing happened. Generate, sir, please. Dumbledore's eyelids flickered, Harry's heart left. Sir, are you water? croaked Dumbledore. Water panted Harry. Yes. He leapt to his feet and seized the goblet he had dropped in the basin. He barely registered the golden locket lying curled beneath it. Aguamanti shouted. 
jabbing the goblet with his wand. The goblet filled with clear water. He dropped to his knees beside Dumbledore, raised his head, and brought the glass to his lips. But it was empty. Dumbledore groaned and began to pant. But I had some weight. A man said Harry again, pointing his wand at the goblet once more for a second. Clear water gleamed within it, but as he approached Dumbledore's mouth, the water vanished again. So I'm trying, I'm trying, said Harry desperately, but he did not think that Dumbledore could hear him. He had rolled onto his side and was throwing great, rattling breaths that sounded agonizing. Aguamanti, Aguamanti, Aguamanti. The goblet filled and emptied once more, and now Dumbledore's breathing was fading, his brain whirling in panic. He knew, instinctively, the only way left to get water. He knew instinctively the only way left to get water because Voldemort had planned it so. He flung himself over to the edge of the rock and plunged the goblet into the lake, bringing, bringing it up full to the brim of icy water that did not vanish. So here he had and lunging forward, he tipped the water clumsily over Dumbledore's face. It was the best he could do. For the icy feeling on his arm not holding the cup was not the lingering chill of the water. A slimy, it was the best he could do. For the icy feeling on his arm not holding the cup was not the lingering chill of the water. Yani elini suya soktuğu için elini, elin ıslanmasını getirdi, soğukluk olmadığını fark ediyor. A slimy white hand had gripped his wrist. And the creature to whom it belonged was pulling him slowly backward across the rock. The surface of the lake was no longer mere smooth. It was churning, and everywhere he looked, white heads and hands were emerging from the dark water. Men and women and children with sunken, sightless eyes were moving toward the rock. An army of the dead rising from the black water. Petrificus totalus yelled Harry, struggling to cling to the smooth, soft surface of the island as he pointed his wand at the inferiors that had his arm. It released him, falling backward into the water with a splash. He scrambled to his feet, but many more inferiors were already climbing onto the rock, their bony hands clawing at its slippery surface. Their blank, frosted eyes upon him, trailing waterlogged rags, sunken faces leering. A trifical total was very below the yen, backing away as he swiped his wand through the air. Six or seven of them crumpled, but more were coming toward him. In pedimenta, in carcurius, a few of them stumbled, one, of, one or two of them bound in drops, but those climbing onto the rock behind them. Middle stepped over on over or on the fallen bodies. Still slashing at the air with his wand, he yelled, Sectum Sempra, Sectum Sempra. But though gashes appeared in their southern legs and their icy skin, they had no blood to spill. They walked on, unfeeling, their shrunken hands outstretched toward him. And as he backed away still farther, he felt arms enclose him from behind, thin, fleshless arms cold as death, and his feet left the ground as they lifted him and began to carry him, slowly and surely, back to the water. And he knew there would be no release, that he would be drowned and become one more dead guardian of a fragment of Voldemort's shattered soul. Ölür mü lan Eri? Harry de şey taşıyor çünkü Voldemort'un ruhunu taşıyor. Düşünüp geliyorum. Harry ölür müydü burada? Bilemedim. Devam. <gülüyor> But then, through the darkness, fire erupted. Crimson and gold, a ring of fire that surrounded the rock so that the inferior holding Harry so tightly stumbled and faltered. They did not dare pass through the flames to get to the water. They dropped Harry, he hit the ground. 
slipped on the rug and fell, grazing his arms, but scrambled back up, raising his wand and staking around. Dumbledore was on his feet again, pale as any of the surrounding infidi, but taller than him too. The fire dancing in his eyes, his wand was raised like a torch and from its tip emanated the flames, like a vast lustre encircling them all with warmth. En zaten şey Fox'ın sahibi olması hani Ankarkuş'un insan vücudundaki temsili olması falan ateşe ihtiyaç olduğu zaman ateşi yapacak insan da Dumbledore'da hani bu açıdan gayet güzel uyum var şu an Dumbledore'un bu sahnede ateşi yapan insan olması fektinde diyelim ve düşüneyim diyecek başka bir şey var mıdır? Devam. The inferi bound into each other, attempting blindly to escape the fire in which they were enclosed. Dumbledore scooped the locket from the bottom of the stone basin and stored it inside his robes. Wordlessly, he gestured to Harry to come to his side. Distracted by the flames, the inferi seemed unaware that their query was leaving as Dumbledore led Harry back to the boat. The ring of fire moving with them, around them, the, the bewildered inferi accompanying them to the water's edge, where they slid gratefully back into their dark waters. Burayı tam anlamadım. Okuyup geliyorum. Şu kelimeye bakıyorum. Kuveri diyor. Kuari. Taş ocağı, maden, ağa, ocağı, Türk bir şey diyor. Anlamadım. Tekrar düşünmeye devam. Şey diyor herhalde, yani şu tabiri anlamadım, anlamadım da. Inferi seemed unaware that their query was leaving. Hani ama herhalde şey gibi diyor. As Dumbledore let Harry back to the boat diyor. Yani Dumbledore ile Harry şeye doğru gidiyorlar. Kayıya doğru yürüyorlar. Yani o taş küçük adacığı terk ediyorlar. Terk ettikleri için hani query yani o taş adacık hani o query derken... O adacıktan bahsediyor herhalde. Tekrar inferilere kalıyor falan. Bu tarz bir şey diyor herhalde. Yanlış anlamadıysam düşünmeye devam. Okumaya devam ediyorum. Harry who was shaking all over thought for a moment that Dumbledore might not be able to climb into the boat. He staggered a little as he attempted it. All these efforts seemed to be going into maintaining the ring of protective flame around them. All, all his efforts seemed to be going into maintaining the ring of protective flame around them. He seized him and helped him back to his seat. Once they were both safely jammed inside the alien, the both began to move back across the black water, away from the rock, still encircled by the ring of fire. Hayır, orayı yanlış anlamışım ama geri dönmeyeceğim. Hani şey diyor, hala once they were both safely jammed inside again, the boat began to move back across the black water diyor. Away from the rug, still encircled by the ring of fire. And it seemed that the infinity swarming below them did not dare reach her face. Ha tamam o rock hala ateş halkası içinde olan rock değil. Sonra tekrar kendisinden bahsetmeye başladı. Onlar şeyler. Ateş şu an şey sarıyor yani. Kayı tahmine doğruymuş yani. İlk başta söylediğim şey sorun yok diyoruz. Yine bir kere daha okuyayım. Once they were both safely jammed inside again. Botun yani şeyin, kayın. The both began to move back across the black water. Tamam. Away from the rock. Still encircled by the ring of fire. Tamam aynen. Ben burada rock still encircled by the ring of fire gibi düşündüydüm ama şeymiş bot yani çünkü damdor büyü yapıyor sonuçta damdorun etrafında yani and it seemed that the inferi swarming below them did not dare to surface çünkü ateş şu an damdorun etrafında deniyor falan very good doğru demişim devam sir pantadeli sir i forgot about fire they were coming at me and i panicked <laughs> quite understandable murmur damdor Harry was alarmed to hear how faint his voice was. 
they reached the bank with a little bump and he leapt out, then turned quickly to help Dumbledore. The moment that Dumbledore reached the bank, he let his one hand fall. The ring of fire vanished, but the infinity did not emerge again from the water. The little boat sank into the water once more, clanking and tinkling. Its chains slithered back into the lake, too. Dumbledore gave a great sigh and leaned against the cavern wall. I am weak, he said. Don't worry, sir, said he at once. Anxious about Dumbledore's extreme pallor and his and by his air of exhaustion. Don't worry, I'll get us back. Lean on me, sir. I'm pulling Dumbledore's uninjured arm around his shoulders. He guided his headmaster back around the lake, bearing most of his weight. The protection was, after all, well designed, said Dumbledore faintly. One alone could not have done it. You did well, very well, Hedy. Don't talk now, said Hedy, fearing how slurred Dumbledore's voice had become, how much his feet dragged. Save your energy, sir. We'll soon be out of here. The dark wave will have sealed again. My knife, there is no need. I got cut on the rock, said Hedy, Hedy said Hedy firmly. Just tell me where, here. He wiped his grace forearm upon the stone. Having received its tribute of blood, the Ark Bay reopened instantly. They crossed the other cave, and he held Dumbledore back into the icy seawater that filled the crevice in the cliff. It's going to be all right, sir, he said over and over again, more worried by Dumbledore's silence than he had been by his weakened voice. We're nearly there. I can operate us both back. Don't worry. I'm not worried, he said Dumbledore. His voice a little stronger despite the freezing water. I am with you. Niye böyle bir ses çıkardım hatırlar? Çünkü bu bölüm Dumbledore'u kaybediyoruz. Bundan dolayı çıkardım. Chapter 27 The Lightning Struck Tower Diyecek bir şey var mıdır? Düşünüyorum. Nope. Hadi görüşürüz.